2019. AEW uh, had their all out <laughs> um, press. C- Listen, it's relevant. Um, but all right, so brief little summary slash kind of like summation. This past Sunday, AEW, literally as we were doing our live stream, which if you haven't checked it out, you should. It's available for free play. It's available wherever podcasts can be streamed. But AEW was having their all-out press conference, their media scrum, which they do after every pay-per-view. But this one was a little bit more tangy uh, than other ones in the past because CM Punk decided to use this platform to kind of air his grievances uh, on rumors surrounding Cole Cabana, uh, his uh, behind-the-scenes issues with uh, Hangman Adam Page, as well as the Young Bucks. Now, we were kind of talking about this before the show, but there's like a whole timeline. So, Mo, did you want to go through the timeline, or did you want me to go through the timeline? Because I'm, I lot. guess we could kind of both. It's, it's all over the place, and I'm still piecing it together because... Right. I mean, I, I'm pretty sure you all watched the clip and I had to watch it several times because at first, when I first listened to it, I thought the interviewer provoked Punk to talk about Colt Cabana, mm-hmm. but he just triggered himself. He just decided he's going to take this, it was like a 25 minute rant, and this went off for at least five minutes on just Colt Cabana airing out his business and his financials. So I had to backtrack and um, that that triggered him based off of the Young Bucks. Mm-hmm. releasing some information to a press or whatever what was it was it a certain source I think that was that a we should mention sources, yeah a couple of sources yeah. yeah so they basically put out this idea that punk was responsible for blacklisting Colt Cabana which otherwise made him look bad because he's supposed to be like their bigger baby face for the company and now like you have these news sources going around saying that you know, your top baby face, you know, this guy that you're investing all this money into that everyone wants to see. Yeah, he's an asshole who's stopping people's bags and shit. Right. You know? Um, and right. it, then and that was how long ago? That was before the injury? That was before the injury. Or during the I injury. I think it was before or like right at the beginning of the injury. And he's been out for how many weeks to be exact? I, I think it was um to be honest, I don't know how long he was he was out. I'm thinking like between like it was it was like a couple months. Like I think it was like two to three months because he came to LA in June. And I think that that was like his last match. Like the following week he said that he had to like take like a break or whatever the case may be. So I think it's been like two two I would say a little bit under three months. So eight to twelve weeks you're harvesting all this bitter ass anger. Let's just start there. Yeah. Um yeah, absolutely. <laughs> then we have a promo with Adam Hangman Page. But this was before the injury, correct? Uh Adam that he Hang- cut this promo. Uh, Hang- mm-hmm. I believe it was either before the no, it was before the injury. Injury. Because yes, before the injury. Pro- because, because this was this promo was leading up towards their world title match. And Hangman was still the champion. And Hangman he, was still the champion. Yep. And then I don't think Punk was able to give his receipt back till afterwards. So he's been yeah. harvesting all of this energy for eight to twelve weeks. That is insane. And like and like we discussed before, um, we recorded. Punk's not really active on social media. Like he'll post something here or there, but he's not like vocal like the rest of the EVP. So he's literally just been harvesting this, and it was just so such awkward timing because. You know, um, they just went on with a about five hour long pay-per-view with like 14 matches and it ended with him positively ending with him retaining his belt and his championship. They go straight in and have this um, this interview with uh, the scrums. What what, what are they called again? It's 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 a it's they call it media scrum. So it's the all out media scrum media scrum. Okay, yeah, so they do their all media scrums, and this man just takes about 25 minutes to just get on the elite's asses. Does, I, I can't remember what was the question that the interviewer has asked, but it turned into, are you friends with Colt Cabana? And then dragging Colt Cabana, um, 
talking about this man's financials, how his bank account's attached to his mother's, how he helped pay for all his fucking bills until he didn't want to pay for his bills anymore. Oof. And he didn't even want to answer this question or spill any tea until he got confirmation from the reporter that they're not friends because that's how much he strongly dislikes this man. And this somehow also segue with him into him, um, whatchamacallit, a, a segue into him dragging Adam Hangman Page, which when I listened to the interview again, it almost didn't make any sense because it sounded like he was upset with him because he didn't want to take some of his veteran advice, which was kind of strange to me. Um, I don't have it word from word. I wish I had the, the uh, script in front of me. But he was upset that he wasn't he wasn't willing to take any of his veteran advice and he was willing to make mistakes on his own mm -hmm. um, and that they cut a promo and he said some things that he didn't like. And I rather than taking it up with him again, he waited to uh, uh, till they got to this media scrums and it just threw me off because, again, doesn't AEW have meetings before their shows, don't they have like a, like they gather up the crew, correct? Yeah. It means tell me everyone's been sitting in a room that's hot and heavy just and, and angry, and you want to wait till right after the show to take everything and then make it about you and take away everyone else's moment, make it about you. It was so strange and it was so bizarre. Feel free to chime in and cut me off because I'll just keep going about this. I was going to say, I didn't, I, I, I didn't want to eat, eat his ass out. I, I, I didn't want to cut you off, but um, yeah, like that's, I think, I think that, I think that's pretty, pretty accurate as to kind of the build up towards it. Um, as far as like all of this kind of building up now, apparently over the past couple of weeks, they've also had like, talent meetings, stuff like that, backstage meetings, not just with, you know, potential personal issues between the wrestlers, but between WWE tampering with contracts. So I'm pretty sure that they've had multiple uh, meetings to kind of sit down and had the opportunity to hash things out. But that is what led to happen afterwards, which is essentially that um, CM Punk, A Steel, Kenny Omega, the Bucks, uh, apparently Michael, Michael Nakazawa and Brandon Cutler all had a physical altercation. Some people are saying that um, a steel bit Kenny Omega, that CM Punk swang on Nick Jackson and knocked him out. Um, but essentially, um, but essentially, they threw a chair at him and gave him a black yeah, eye. They, yeah, yeah, threw a chair. Like yeah. somebody got a chair through with them, got the black eye. But essentially, Things got physical after that. And I think the the initial report was that the elite was the one or the, the elite was the entity that initiated the physical confrontation, which I thought was very interesting because that is a very, very Brooklyn thing. Very, to do. very Brooklyn. Thing. Um, um <laughs> that is a, that. It's like are y'all just Y'all from Cali? Are you are you sure you're, you're from California? But um, well, in their defense, but, uh, didn't Punk say in that same rant that you know if you have a problem, take it up with me? And they said, "I yeah. bet." Yeah, they bet. Say less. Yeah, they bet. <laughs> Soon as that man finished his pastry, it was on. Right, it was literally on. Like, so I can't really blame them for for taking that approach. But things got physical now because we've been keeping track of the situation for the past couple of days. Um, reports have been coming out saying that apparently everybody who was involved in that altercation will not be available or has been, I should say, has been suspended um, and will not be appearing on Dynamite. I assume that means that they won't be on Rampage as well. And by the end of Wednesday, CM Punk and Ace Steel are either going to be suspended or out of the company. Which, and this is, I believe, Sports Illustrated reported this. So I'm just like, ooh, this is heavy. But this is, this is very, very interesting. Because I feel like there's so many layers to this issue. Um, I wanted you to start. Because I feel like you had a lot of things to sound off on. And I just feel I like... I might be all over the place like with this. Because, talk to like, talk to I'm, I'm mad at so many people. But I'm primarily mad at punk 
Mm -hmm. And but it starts with Tony Khan, so I got I got to chew his ass out first, because okay. you sat there and watched him tear down your company for twenty five minutes and expose your business mm -hmm. for being disorganized, for being all over the place, and clearly you're a boss that does not barely a boss, but he's the man that basically signs the fucking paychecks and shit. But he does not know how to be a boss. He does not know how to control his fucking children. Is it, it the, your EVPs are supposed to be a representation of you? And the yeah. fact that it's to a point where yeah. we started off with just like the, the lower cards, like maybe like a, some beef with the females and some beef with the mid cards on um, fighting and stuff like that. But now it has escalated to the point that the people that are main eventing um, your top cards, your top draws or whatnot, um, the people that are again your fucking EVPs are lashing out on each other, right. and again, right. Tony Khan just watched CM Punk just go off about it and did nothing. Like I watched his cokehead eyes just bug out his fucking head, and he didn't do nothing about it. I was like, yo, it couldn't be. If it was, say what you want to say about Vince McMahon. All right, if if you if you dislike him, I completely understand. I get it. But no one, no one would ever have the thought to have pulled that shit with Vince McMahon sitting beside them. That's a fact. That's the part that got me. I was like, he's really going to let this man just like implode their whole entire company after putting on a five hour long event that is competing with another company? That. Like, do you think that's going to make other people want to sign with your fucking company after right. hearing all this right. fuckery going around? You should have unplugged the man's mic. You should have told him to go get up and go. You're done. You're done. But no, he was stuttering when he tried to cut off Punk, and then he gave up, and he folded. And it's just... <laughs> that right there tells me enough about this company, because we were already talking about it for weeks. How we for don't, weeks. How and why we don't take Tony Khan seriously. Like, he does not come off like a boss. He comes off, again, like a mark with too much money that wants to buddy-buddy with certain wrestlers and another thing the politicking because <clears throat> you could tell which people he picks and chooses to how, how can i go about this there are certain people in the company that i guess have so much access to tony khan and getting whatever they want out of him is almost mm -hmm. to a point where it's not like you're my boss it's more like Again, you're my homie. You're my friend. We're at the same level. And that's exactly what I got out of observing the body language between Punk and Tony Khan. Because for me, watching from where I was sitting, if I didn't even know who was who, I would think that Tony Khan was an assistant or an advocate or a very stressed out PR team going on because he did not present himself like a boss. He right. let... CM Punk say whatever he wants to, he wanted to say and take it as far as he wanted to take it. So that was my first issue with Tony Khan right there. But bringing it back to Punk, I think he's fucking selfish. Mm. Uh, I think he's a fucking narcissist. I think that he's a shell of his former self and he is literally representing everything he did not want to be. And it was all exposed in this interview. I don't know if he was intoxicated. I don't know if he was just stressed. I don't know if it, I, I, don't, I, I can't understand or fathom how you could have such an amazing match with Mox and walk away with the belt and you're 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 filled with all this anger. Like again, no one asked you this question. You were just getting it off your chest and you decided while you're getting it off your chest, you're gonna take down the whole entire company with you. To me, I thought that was a fucked up move because you know, there might have been way too many matches on that goddamn card, but you definitely took away what should have been um, you know, a highlight or a celebration for people like Keith Lee and Swerve. They put on one of their best fucking tag team matches that they did all year. Um, the ladies definitely showed out to make up for Thunder Rosa um, being unable to defend her championship title. So, you know, we should have been talking about Tony Storm. Um, the biggest talk that should have been the whole entire motherfucking night should have been MJF. MJF's return. MJF. And I felt so bad for this man. I feel so fucking bad because it's just like, this whole buildup of everyone wondering what's happened to MJF. Is he going to go to WWE? Is he going to is he gonna stay in AEW? What happens to MJF? You know what I mean? For him to come back at, in such an iconic way, bro, with the whole Joker mask or whatnot, and giving people the finger, and then just popping out the end with the voicemail and all that stuff, 
Like, that should have been a moment. We should have been talking about this shit all week and wondering, oh, my gosh, what's going to happen for Dynamite? What's going to happen for Dynamite? But no, for the last 48 hours, it's been nothing but being consumed with this EVP versus punk drama and who's getting suspended and what, you know? And it's 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 not just CM Punk to blame. It's fucking Tony Khan. Because if he had more rules and regulations like we discussed last week, was it even last week? I don't know. We've been recording. I think it was either last week or the week before. Last week or the week before. We've we've been talking about this. How he literally needs to tighten up on his fucking kids and, and put down some ground rules. Because if he had that to begin with, this shit wouldn't have happened. Very true. They know that they could run over him. He's a fucking doormat. He's he doesn't know how to be a fucking boss. I'm sorry. I'm swearing because this is supposed to go on YouTube. And then, <laughs> I just thought about it. Well, it looks I'm like sorry, this video won't like, be made for kids, like so I'll put that. I'm so sorry. Shit. I'm so sorry that I'm swearing left and right. It's just that it, I'm angry for the talent. I'm angry for everyone else involved that's doing their job and doing everything right. And then you just right. have, again, someone who doesn't know how to lead a company, you know, who enabled all these narcissists that we have in the room here. And then someone like Punk, where it's just like, you're a veteran. You want people to take advice from you? And look at the shit that you're pulling. Literally having a company that is working very hard. They 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 definitely stuck their neck out for you, putting you in, put um, putting you in this position to carry a world title, strapping the rocket to you, and this is how you give back to them mm-hmm. because you're mad about one article. Come on now, grow up. This is something we would expect out, out of the rookies. You've grown. He's in his fucking forties. I'm sorry, <laughs> y'all. You're I'm good. sorry. I gotta, I gotta, I gotta reel back on the swearing. I gotta reel back on the swearing. I'm gonna let you chime in because I, I'll go all podcasts on this man. So here's the the ironic part about this. I started off this season with a 10 minute pod called the warm up, and I said that everything rises and falls on leadership. And I think even though I was talking about Vince McMahon then, the same applies for Tony Khan now. What happens is. I feel like what happens in today's corporate culture, we want our leaders to be transparent, empathetic, relatable. But what happens is that when you're around of a lot of when you're around a lot of wrestlers who have been a victim to a certain power structure and a certain power dynamic, you have to be very, very careful because the last thing you want to do is serve as as a doormat, as you said, as a pushover, as someone, you know, that wrestlers just kind of see as the homie because truth be told if i'm signing your checks i'm not your boy i'm your boss dog i'm your leader dog and i feel like a lot of grown men and grown women don't like hearing that because they don't want they don't like this idea of having to quote unquote follow orders or 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 be under somebody's leadership but the facts are the facts if, unless you're trying to start your own wrestling company and i'm signing your checks dog i'm your i'm your boss i'm your ceo now, I'm not going to sit up here and, you know, be, you know, a beefhead and I'm not going to be like a dictator and I'm not going to be disrespectful and call you out your name. But there needs to be a respect for leadership. But then on the other end of the spectrum, as a leader, what are you doing to get that respect? You can't be sitting over here being buddy buddy with everybody for three years and then sit up at a media scrum and say that you're not going to take it anymore when you're talking about uh wwe tampering on your contract is like are you really not taking it anymore because you've been so focused on everybody being everybody's friend for the past three years that you haven't demanded respect and the fact that it's gotten to this point of you trying to like warn people about the whole tampering situation it's already too late so that's what i had to say about tony khan from that perspective i feel like Like MJF said, there's people in the wrestling business who don't need to be in the wrestling business. He belongs in the crowd. He's a mark who has a lot of money. And I think that that's showing now because it seems like he never really has a stance on anything. He just stands next to who's ever hot or who's ever his favorite. So he's He has a stance, though. He does have a stance. I notice he he picks and chooses when he wants to have some balls. That's Mm -hmm. another thing that annoys me about him because he'll find the most random interviews to like nip at and they'll shock me that he'll actually nip back at somebody. Mm -hmm. But it's just like, why don't you have that same energy for your own roster? And here's another that, but here's another thing. You were so vocal about talking about Swole after her interview on a whole other podcast. And she was being respect and she was being respectful, but punk literally 
destabilizing an entire company with one media scrum and you're just like a, like a deer in the headlights is just like you pick and choose you're very very loud about suspending eddie kingston but you want to leak reports to sports illustrated you're very very loud about criticizing swole but you're quiet when you're talking about punk i want to know why because it wow. seems like it's only and so was the rest of the roster like that got me right. so irritated because all swole did was politely articulate the reason why she departed mm-hmm. and it was mainly because she just said lack of representation because she says that she wants her daughter to be able to look at the screen and see someone that looks like her. You know what I mean? A lot a lot of um, ethnic kids, like people like me, wanted to see that growing up. And she was making a very valid point that she, there wasn't enough representation across the screen when it came to the women's division. And right. she also felt like the women's division was being treated like a bit of a joke. She worded it a lot more politely than I am. <laughs> yeah. But she didn't drag Tony yeah. Khan. She didn't say nothing negative about Tony Khan. She didn't say he was a bad person or whatnot. He immediately ignored everything else that she said. That shit went up for like a like a couple hours, and his response was something petty and childish, as "You weren't a very good wrestler, so that's why we released you." And I and and that and, and then think, on top and of I, that, and, and, that <clears throat> and I think go ahead, go ahead, I'm sorry. I was just gonna sorry. say, <laughs> and I think that that another problem that I've noticed, especially with Tony, is that it doesn't look like. He's like securing himself, like he's stable in himself. You know what I mean? Um, so, and and I could tell by just how he responds to things and his stance on certain things, because it, it just seems like, you know, like I'm a nerd too, but like at the same time, he just seems like a nerd who just kind of wants to get one over on people he feels like he can get one over on because he was, I don't know, like what he was going through when he was younger. But it just, something about him screams insecurity. And I think that 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 leaks through the way that he leads because he's so focused on being liked and he's not respected. And there's a difference between the two. You can be liked and not respected. There was even jokes about it in the beginning of the company when like Cody and and them would be on BTE. Oh, we're just going to spend Tony's money. But all all jokes contain true shit. All jokes contain some true shit. So I feel like that was spineless. Yeah. So I, you know, he's very much spineless, so I, and you know. he he started off this whole company with being like a people pleaser. So as soon as he got like the slightest bit of criticism, he's like, "I've been giving you guys what you want. Why are right. you guys upset with me?" Right. Right. You know, like you right. you would see, you know, some chips and some some flaking in his fragile ego. Like it's it's really sad. Like, and the reason why I also bought up Big Swole was because I noticed that the whole locker room, the people that weren't even involved in this. She didn't drag nobody else. She didn't say she didn't badmouth nobody in that in that um interview. People were coming out the gates left and right, you know, trying to endorse Tony Khan or whatever and saying, like, oh, he's a great boss, you know, you're just this and that. Tony Khan has treated me like gold and da-da-da-da. I noticed again, everyone's pretty quiet. Now I'm not sure if there's any legal reasons if maybe the whole locker room can, considering that the police did get involved in the fight. That maybe no one could just comment on anything, right. you know, about their treatment in the company. But I just right. find it really, really strange how everyone had all this energy for Big Swole just, you know, giving an honest analysis about her experience in the company as as a woman of color. You know, everyone came out the woodworks for her and was attacking her, and and people were were like approving it. Like I, I saw podcasts and, and other analysis where people were condoning this type of behavior but you're fucking elites you know the people who are, are supposed to be your main eventers the people who are really pulling out your merch and supposed to be representing your company they're running rampant and no one's saying anything and no one's commenting on how this could you know this is all a reflection of, of tony khan as a boss and yeah. i had to put quotations because it yeah. doesn't it really doesn't feel like it now Going from going from Tony to Punk, because I, I was able to touch a little bit on Tony, but I never touched on on Punk. I think that Punk, it's so funny, because when I thought about it, Punk and, and Triple H are really just the same person. One just has more tattoos than the other. Um, because I feel like what Punk was doing at that moment, if this was real, which I'm going to confront at the end of my little spiel. And I'm going to, I'm going to relay that to you. But I, I think that if Punk was 
was for real and he was shooting the way that he was shooting, number one, this idea of like veterans telling young guys to take care of ice is not something that's a new idea. Like that's something that a lot of old heads pride themselves on. Like you need to listen to me. Like I'm your big homie. I'm trying to help you out. Sting has said that in interviews. Um, Flair, like anyone who's anyone. And I'm pretty sure that guys like Cena and Roman feel the same way. Like dog, I'm, I've been drawing money. I'm been doing this, that, and the third. I'm trying to help you out. I'm trying to put you on. Um, and even down to like FTR hopped on the podcast and was talking about punk because, you know, there were reports about punk coming out being like standoffish and like a diva, whatever the case may be. And he was just like, well, this man has been inviting people into his locker room and saying, yo, I want to critique your match. Like, like watching people's matches and giving them feedback on it and, and trying to help out some of the younger guys like powerhouse Hobbs and stuff like that and guys like that. So I think that him taking offense to people not wanting to take his advice is a very, very classic veteran pro wrestler move. Do I think that it's the right thing though? Um, but I also think that him, I think a lot of his frustration was that. I think it was also the fact that when Hangman was cutting his promo, Hangman was alluding to the conflict that Punk had with Cole Cabana as well in his promo. And um, that was another thing that I think got him mad that because he doesn't utilize social media, he was not able to confront on a consistent basis. And I think that he kind of used his media scrum as a platform to um, air out his grievances because he doesn't use, utilize social media, because he wasn't on TV as much over the past two to three months. You know, this was supposed to be summer of punk too until that injury. And then that's kind of what led to John Moxley taking over. And I feel like if Punk was able to be present this entire summer, I think that we wouldn't have had as much tension because he would have been able to relegate and delegate accordingly and probably be able to, to solve in a timely manner as opposed to like leaving, not being there for two months and then coming back. Um, now, what I will say about him going off on Hangman and the Bucks and Cole Cabana, personally, I would not have done it. However, I am empathetic towards the fact that, like, he was like, listen, I don't talk about stuff like this, but this has been, like, burning because people on the internet have been talking about punk. Like, I was w listening to a podcast, and they were talking about how punk is a bad person because of how he treated Cole Cabana. And it's like, that stuff has been out there in the public for years on end. So I understand him wanting to air out his grievances then and there. However, there is a term called discernment. You don't have to say everything when you want to say it. You have to read the room. You know that MJF just had one of the most iconic returns. You know that that's a, a feud that's building. So why, and, and you know the value of your voice. You're one of the most coveted people in pro wrestling. Of course, when you say something and you go off on something, it's going to overshadow a lot of things that happen on a pretty eventful show. So if I'm in punk shoes, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a chill for now. Or I may just handle it backstage. Or I may just talk to who I need to talk to to get it solved. Because at the end of the day, if I'm for the young guys and I understand my value, I'm not going to put them in a position where their value goes down or what they do goes down in value. Because it wasn't just, in, like you said, it wasn't just the MJF return. It was the building of that whole faction around him. It was Tony winning the title. It was Keith and Swerve winning their titles. Um, so, like, I think there was multiple things at stake that he should have considered before he went off like that. With that being said, I think this is a work. <laughs> I think this is a work. And, and at first, I was like, why would this be a work? And if you allow me some of your time, I just want to tell you why I think this is a work. So what show is happening in two weeks from today? Dynamite. <laughs> Dynamite, Dynamite Grand, Grand Slam. Dynamite. Oh, Grand Slam. I forgot about that shit. Which happens, which happens in New York City. It's probably going to be their biggest arena show of the year. At least that's on television when you exclude all the other pay-per-views. 
New York is the number one media market in the world. You go to New York, you know that it's going to be an eventful show. You want to create the scene for a big show. So, all right, I'll let CM Punk go off and air out his grievances. Or maybe they were just backstage and they kind of figured this out all together. My opinion, I think that the Young Bucks as well as CM Punk, are very much aware of today's wrestling climate with social media and the internet and reports, and they know what gets indie marks going, and they know how to trigger people. And they were also able to run a litmus test with MJF. We swore MJF was going to WWE until we saw him back at All Out. And the way that he came back shows me extension or not, contract or not, This was something that had to be talked about for MJF to come back to All Out in Chicago after Punk wins the title at All Out. This is something that's a very, very meticulous plan. But mind you, leading up into that, oh, reports are saying that MJF is in talks with WWE. Reports are saying that MJF is this, that, and the third. Everybody, or at least a good amount of people, weren't even expecting an MJF return because of what the reports were saying, because of what sources were saying. They were able to kind of see that and assess that in real time and and be able to say, okay, well, we see that this works. We can apply this method to other things. Also, when we just look at that weekend of wrestling, if we're being honest, All Out was not the most talked about event of the weekend. (laughs) And so I feel like this is a good way to generate buzz Because like you said, it was a five-hour pay-per-view and people were tuned out and not necessarily engaged uh, towards the end of the pay-per-view because it was so long. How do you keep people engaged? You create a moment. You create a moment. Wait, so are you implying that that fight never happened? I'm implying that this whole thing is, yeah, I think this is a whole work. Yeah, I think this is a whole work. I think this is a whole work. Because they were very descriptive about who was in that fight, what happened in the fight. Who broke it up? Jericho getting involved and speaking to Tony Khan before he was left alone with them to handle it whatever way he was going to handle it. Like, mm-hmm. that that would be really fucked up to the fans, to be I, honest. But at this end, like, you, well, I, you traumatized I, us, Tony I, Khan. Right. If that's at, the case. But this is the reason why this makes it so interesting. If this, if this um, particular incident was by default it means that tony khan is currently perhaps the worst leader in wrestling if this was by design this means that he's one of the best creative minds but either way you're still talking about it like and i think that that's one of the things that makes it such a polarizing case like yes it's traumatizing but it's like when we're talking about real storylines and we're talking about real narratives in wrestling, you have to adjust to the, t- to the times. You have to adjust to wait to... I'm trying to phrase my words correctly. You have to adjust to adjust to what feels real and what feels relevant and what feels intriguing. We've, like, even with the whole... We've been seeing, we've been seeing it on Raw. When we see, when, you know, when Dexter Loomis first started pop- popping up, when, like... He was, like, coming through the crowd and, like, that camera angle and stuff like that. And now we're seeing it manifest in a new way. But I feel like if if wrestling wants to evolve, they have to evolve with the things that feel real. And I feel like, you know, an indie report, a suspension, this is what feels real. So I wouldn't be surprised if this is a work. And I And, you know, I could be wrong. I'm just saying, I just feel like it's a word. If it's not, what happens if it's not? Like, how do we move forward? Like, we literally, like, from what the other reports they were saying, that um, everyone that was involved in that whole entire fight, um, several of them got suspended and some of them were removed. We don't know which names were removed quite yet. But it's just like, what do you do moving forward? Like, we just crowned a champion last pay per view, and mm-hmm. whoop, you know, we like that belt's vacated, and we're also wondering what happens with MJF. Like, right. you know, how are we going to re spark him coming back, considering that all the attention has been pulled away because From of him. this incident? Does he come back and cut a pipe bomb 
on what just happened? Like, what do you do? Like, how do you work with this and even make it into like an angle that doesn't make the company look embarrassing? Because well, a lot of people are allegedly aren't well, showing up tomorrow. I'm sorry, not tomorrow, tonight. Right. I I would say that that's not for us as fans to figure out. I think that's for the executives at AEW to, <laughs> to, to figure out because I feel like this is ultimately going to be the test of Tony Khan's leadership. This whole past three years, we want to change the world of pro wrestling, forbidden door this, diversity that. that it's cute to be diverse when, you know, you have a black woman as your CBO. You don't have that anymore. It's cute to have the forbidden door. <laughs> Listen, you don't have uh, Brandy is <laughs> out of here. Brandy, Brandy had her, her, her baby that cured racism her, her, her and she got up out of there. You don't she have Brandy as your CBO you anymore. <laughs> um <laughs> Forbidden Door is cute when you have all of New Japan's most valuable former assets and now they're in a position where they kind of have to do a show of you to regenerate interest in that company. All this Forbidden Door stuff is cute when, when business is best for you. All this diversity stuff is cute when business is best for you. But when you have to go between arguably your favorite wrestler and the wrestlers that made your company attractive to attract your favorite wrestler to come back in the first place, who do you side with? Because ultimately, a decision has to be made, which means that a stance has to be taken. So you have to decide, do you want a healthy work environment by keeping Kenny, the Bucks, and who may have you? Or do you just want to be the guy known for bringing CM Punk back and just keep him happy? Because I'm telling you this, if this is real, one of them got to go. One of them got to go. CM Somebody got to go. go. Somebody got to go. Somebody got to go. It's not a loss Somebody if he goes. Go. It's not a loss if he goes. Like, I'm not, I don't mean to be a dickhead. It's just that he was excited in the beginning, but it's just like he's kind of old. He's kind of worn out. He keeps it's getting the injured. Honeymoon period is, it's the has, honeymoon has, period has, has worn off. Has, and I think that that's something that he and kind I have of another alluded question. to that would happen. Yeah. No, I had a question because it's just like, what, hypothetically, if he gets fired, do you think another company is going to work with him? Do you think that even Hunter would bother calling him? Do you think yeah. they would try to repair their yeah. relationship? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Really? Absolutely. absolutely. Considering yeah. everything that's been said and done. Considering every, Considering dog, every Scott Siner was slandering Stephanie McMahon for the better part of 20 years. That man still ended up in the Hall of Fame, and his son is the NXT champion. <laughs> like, what are we like, doing? Fair response. Like, I, like <laughs> I, I think that, and 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 let's not, let's not act like we got a guy who's considered one of the top heels in the business. In 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 the Miz, who was a quote unquote locker room cancer at one point. That he's, that's the reason why he had to change outside the locker room at one point. But people change and people grow and people will always have that capacity to change and grow. And I don't think that you should base CM Punk's value off of an incident, real or fake, uh, with a certain set of people, especially if there's a whole other different set of people that have been singing his praises with FTR and talking about how he's tried to help a lot of the young guys. I think Punk has a lot of value and I think that Hunter, more than Vince, probably has a little bit more of an advantage of acquiring Punk uh, to come back to WWE. Um, so I, I, I could see Hunter making that call and being like, so what's up? Um, Imagine him lining what Hunter say, on TV? Say, Holy fuck, that'd be insane. Huh? huh? If they took Hunter him back and, and had him align, right? that, what's like... That would be insane if they were aligned together, if like on TV, but they're kind of semi shooting their promos, you know. Like, yeah. yeah. At that point, yeah, we do got a war. We really do got a war if they were real, really a like a real back, life. But I, like a real I was gonna say, yeah. Gonna would say, Would you think that would, WWE would, 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 would take Punk back? Would take and I have punk one more question for you before we wrap up. Question for you before we wrap up. Um, honestly, I feel like they're willing to go to whatever links would get the money. And even though fans would call CM Punk a sellout, I still feel like if he came back, now they're definitely watching because mm -hmm. they want to know what's going to come out of his mouth. 
And they're probably assuming that if he did get signed, that there's probably somewhere in the agreement where it's like, I say whatever the fuck I want to say during my promos, especially because we're TV 14 right now. You know, mm-hmm. you can't stop me. You can't cut my mic. You know, so I definitely would still watch, even though, mm-hmm. like, if that situation is in, in, in what he did in the sequence of events did actually occur, you know, maybe that did change my opinion of Punk, but I'm not going to lie. It would make amazing television. I don't put it past Hunter to do what it takes to put on, like, a good show and get some ratings, you know? Right. So that's my take. But what was your last question? Now, my last question is this. Now, You're Tony Khan. You're you Tony have to make a decision. Are you, you keeping decision. Punk or the Bucks? Or, and, and, or I should say or Punk or the or Elite. Punk or the Elite. I keep the elite. I feel like they have given more to the company than Punk has. I, not, it's not even I dislike CM Punk as a person. I just feel like if he would have came back sooner into the business when he was closer to his prime, we could have got a lot more out mm-hmm. of him. Um, but yeah. I, I feel like the demeanor I got from watching that interview and he was talking about how he's old he's tired he's this and that and again you saw those promo comparisons that was put up on twitter and all over social media when they're talking about his energy from a year ago versus now it kind of just sounds like you know he had his run and he's kind of exhausted you know what i mean so it's like do you get longevity if you kept him around if this is how he's acting after a year you know and insinuating that yes like this was true and everything that was alleged actually happen you know Mm -hmm. i feel like we've been getting a lot more out of the elite and i feel like for the most part the elite has been problematic you know do i think that they're fit for their roles no they're not but in terms of what they've been doing as talents on tv i feel like they've been showing out and they've been Mm -hmm. doing their job and no one else really has been complaining about them so i would remove the bad seed that's just me i i agree with that i think that the elite are definitely the faction that you want to keep. Punk, I feel like, is has a lot of value. I think he's a great wrestler. I think that his run over the past year has been very much a nostalgia act, which is the reason why I have a feeling that this is a work, because this is something to keep his interest beyond the honeymoon period that he's been experiencing. But if, if this is real, I think that um, I would just keep the elite. The elite have, you can't have all elite wrestling without the elite. I feel like Cody having a legitimate departure to WWE was already enough of a red flag and you don't want to lose the whole gang because you know that if if Cody is out of there and the Bucks and Kenny leave, Hunter is following up with the best looking contract that he can put together and the best looking package that he can put together. And I, I, and I don't want that. I, I feel like I would get more out of Kenny Omega who, by the way, is creating the AEW video game. Um, um, oh, that's a fact. I, I keep forgetting that they're having that come out. Like, that's it. Yeah. What, do you, fight, what would you do? I, I, is yeah, it, fight, isn't him fight. and Adam Cole also? Yeah, they're both working on I think on they're, that, I think they're, they, they well, they have, they're, I think they're, well, they have, they, they have, like, they have, they, they have a whole like, crew of, like, people kind of, like, putting and piecing that together. But I, yeah, um, then what do you do? I, Did you have to scrap I, the whole game? Yeah, exactly. And we're not trying to do that because they just already spent a bunch of money on it. So I would keep Kenny in the elite. I would keep the Kenny in the elite. I feel like there's more matchups available for them and more opportunity for them. And I feel like they're what makes the company more attractive to other wrestlers to come over. Also, not to mention that Malachi Black is taking a leave of absence. We don't know if that's tied to his role in AEW or his mental health. Apparently, it's because of his mental health. Sending love and light his way. I hope you get better and recover and know that you're not alone if you're even watching this. Um, but yeah, I, I feel like you retain the elite. I think that should be the priority over everything. Also, and I and I when I want I want to leave the show on this cliffhanger because your facial reactions be funny as hell. What if this was all a scheme for us to not even be thinking about the undisputed elite? Because who's talking about Adam Cole right now? And we're going to end on that note. (laughs) Thank you guys so much for tuning in to Culture 316. And we'll see you guys next week. Bye.